We have another week of the Overwatch 2 questions from the Overwatch University subreddit, but this week I actually filtered out some of the very, very common repeat questions that people ask on the subreddit. Here we go. First question of the week is how to play Cassidy with his new stun grenade. I've noticed if I play the new cast at the range, I played the old cast, my grenade never lands. So I have to get much closer when I'm engaging with enemies. This has been a struggle for me because I'd r much rather duel someone at medium range where I can retreat to cover between shots. But this new grenade forces me to go up close where I have no cover and I just have to hit all my shots or die. Is this new cast just a short range brawler now or maybe a backline harasser? I don't know what to do please let me know any tips you have so very evidently this seems like somebody who didn't play overwatch one i'm going to pick apart this first part what do you mean you played the new cast at the range you played the old cast nothing changed for his damage fall off first of all so you don't have to change any of your range that you used to play him on that's number one number two you don't have to get close to engage with your enemies with your grenade uh your grenade should be used defensively you don't need it at the mid or uh, long range at all to confirm any kills it's there to protect you or your team if someone hard commits or dives onto you or someone squishy that's nearby you your role as cassidy is that you sit at a very medium range not too far away where your damage ends up falling off by 50 percent but medium the close range if it happens that you are close enough to close the gap and apply some cc with the grenade to hinder them and confirm a couple of shots so be it but the grenade should be like secondary or tertiary to yourself like the the primary focus is to hit your shot secondary is time your rolls third is like okay the grenade if it comes up not a short range brawler none of that mid-range okay uh no need to to feel like this is uh your main ability by any stretch which interesting spelling is the highest burst healing hero in a race to heal an 800 hp hero who can heal him faster first only using abilities and second using ultimates as well Bap healing using his shift which is regenerative burst for you console players and focusing on healing would need 10 seconds by the math i've done here if he uses his ultimate the time is uh, needed is cut by half more are using her e which is uh, her orb and primary can heal 806 seconds and her heal heals 805.7 seconds your turn do the math for one hero let's find the fastest so my gut instinct is anna you throw a nade but you time a primary fire at the same time so you can shoot you can throw a nade into the air and then you shoot an unscoped shot because there's a projectile travel time and they hit the target at the same time or the grenade hits just before so that the first projectile goes and then you get it gets amplified and then you do another follow-up shot and that's like a lot of hp very very fast that's like 300 400 hp in like under a second or like about one second if you include nano boost with ana it's like instant burst nade project uh unscope shot into probably a scope shot nano that's like 600 hp one second that probably wins by far the second is probably like zenyatta transcendence right that thing heals 300 hp per second if i'm not mistaken so that just beats out everything else oh they actually did the math here when i scroll down to the top comment oh here we go on a nades for 90 hp then land a first heal shot at the same time for 105 at literally the zero second mark then three more shots for 105 because of the amplified heal for three seconds so by the two and a half second mark it's 510 hp and then if you want to fill another 290 HP, you need to do four more shots at the default 70 HP heal, which is 3.2 seconds, 5.6. Moira heals 135 uh, per second with the orb and spray, but the orb only heals 300 HP, last 4.6 seconds, so you can heal 622 HP in that time with the spray added, and then needs to add another 180 HP after only spray, which takes around 2.6 seconds, total time 7.2 seconds. And then none of the other supports can even come close to the same burst heal, uh, healing output, so that's the whole story. Anna wins here. There's your total answer here. Two heroes that can do the most burst without their ultimate. Then with ultimates, Zenyatta Trank, Anna Nano Boost on top of this. Case closed. Why does everybody say Junker Queen is so good? Who's saying that? She feels horrible to play in 80% of the situations, especially right now. I don't get it. From my experience, she's really fun. Agreed. Until she's not also agreed since i have decent aim i used to drop 40 to 50 elims on her against silver and gold but then once i climbed and reached diamond it's just farmer sees roadhogs malkas and people are not hard inting anymore Junker queen has zero mitigation the tank buffs didn't do much since she has zero armor okay the tank buffs helped her because of the headshot reduction it helped a lot of heroes that didn't have any armor by default to just be tankier overall especially one that has a hitbox that 
It's pretty easy to hit. Easy in the sense that like there's no mitigation that can stop it at any point. So the headshot damage reduction, pretty good. I used to go for cover, go for squishies, bait cooldowns, but I can't do anything if the enemy runs half the roster. Even Lucio and Cass, which are strong right now, can just make it so annoying for Queen. Every time you go uh, for the axe, it gets booped or hindered. If you want to alt, there's Suzu, Sleep, Anti, Cass, Hinder, Roadhog, Cook. So many things, etc., etc. Either I'm crazy or she's the hardest tank to play right now because you legitimately need to hit every knife on a squishy where a roadhog just have to land 20 to 30 percent, etc., etc. Okay, so this just a, the rest of this is just a vent. So first of all, I don't think Jungle Queen is that great, but she's actually not that terrible, especially in solo queue. Yes, a lot of the roster makes it very hard to play, but that goes for a lot of the tanks right now. Some of the heroes you mentioned make tanks a nightmare, like you know, you say Farah makes it very hard for most tanks because they can't reach her. You know, Lucio and Cass. Cass can, you know, annoy Ball, Winston, Doomfists, etc. Lucio as well because they can boop him back. So it's not just a Junker Queen only problem. That being said, she's not great. I would rate her probably B minus. Like, it's acceptable in a lot of cases. The team will not always run perfect counters, but you have to pick Darker Queen selectively. She's not like a perma pick on every map and every scenario, because she's not a generalist. She has very distinct weaknesses. I think that's okay. Uh, the armor change for her in, in the mid-season nine, mid-season 10 patch, where like all the pellets and small instances of damage do half the damage on armor targets, hurt her quite a bit. And you will be spending a lot of your time shooting the tank, especially in the brawl mirrors, like you have no choice but to shoot them. There are going to be times where like a squishy is caught out of position, then you can get the perfect knife and go for a, a kill. That's solo queue. You punish poor positioning. That's why she's acceptable in a lot of ranked matches for that reason, because there's more things to worry about than like perfect matchups. You like enemies make positional mistakes all the time that you can capitalize on, which makes her acceptable and still like B tier in my opinion, because she has that punishment tool. Unlike Reinhardt, for example, if you're sitting there with your shield up and there's somebody clearly out of position you have to burn a charge which sometimes may not be the right play because like you may not make it there in time or like you know if you don't have shatter what do you do you can't punish it but for queen if you see them out of position like an honest scoped in really close pretty easy to land one knife pretty much a guaranteed kill so that being said 80 percent is kind of like a you know an arbitrary number you put up there i'm gonna put an, another arbitrary number and say 60 percent of the situations but b Low B tier is where I put her. We're over a season through. Was the season nine patch good or bad for the game overall? As you may be aware, Overwatch season nine patch did a lot, changing how the game is played. Heroes that thrive, heroes that are yet to recover, play styles created, changed, altogether removed. People find themselves in completely different positions in rank ladder compared to where they used to be. The latest DPS passive has shown to be beneficial in some instances while being a detriment. Projectile size has increased, making shots easier. Uh, you forgot to include health, Changes, 250 HP, 300 HP for some heroes. Too many for me to go through. Just wanted to get your thoughts on it. So for me personally, I actually think this patch was a major hit. And I think anybody who initially played season nine thought it as well. Uh, we saw a lot of the pro players tweet out when they first play, they first saw the leaked patch notes where all the HP went up. Everyone's like, oh my God, this game is so cooked. But then when the game, when the patch hit, everyone's like, wait, the devs actually cooked because it was actually a lot more fun than they gave credit for. The, the, the reasons why they made some of those changes were you know, actually targeted and I would say met. Number one was to reduce burst, the frustrations of burst damage. So it's limited to heroes like Widowmaker at very long ranges, but has distinct weaknesses, but it got rid of the Junkrat one-shot burst, got rid of Symmetra secondary fire, double tap burst, it got rid of Hanzo one-shot burst. Like they wanted to remove random cheesy one-shots from the game, true. So if you do that and you keep one-shots available, it has to be very, very, with very distinct weaknesses. So like I said, Widowmaker can still do it, but she's very low HP, 200, can be dove pretty easily, I would say. She's much easier to kill than like a Hanzo, unless she's playing across the map. But number two, they ended up like buffing Roadhog at some point in season nine and made like the, the hook distance closer, which gave him his one shot back essentially, especially when combo with the pig pen. And then they made him super tanky and then the tank passed him. And that's why Roadhog is just super annoying in solo queue because he's like the only other hero with a one shot quote unquote. Other than those outliers, I would say the patch was very good. I played the most Overwatch 2 that season. I kind of burnt myself out. Like there's a lot of streamers and myself who are like not playing as much season 10, season 11. There's a slew of reasons. Number one, probably burnout from season nine. I think if you play 500 to a thousand games in a very short period of time, anybody can be burnt out. But I think the game is still very enjoyable from a casual perspective. Um, and you play in a healthy amount, healthy dosage, right? The projectile changes were great to, to bridge the gap between hitting your sh uh, for the casuals to, you know, feel like they can hit their shots, but then also still be rewarded at high ends because you still need like a pretty good form of accuracy, 
right, to hit it, but the satisfaction and the dopamine hits of getting your hit markers, they satisfied that condition. And uh, the DPS passive that they added initially was a pretty big hit. It actually allowed them to cut some of the burst healing down and make the DPS roll feel useful because DPSs were the weakest at that time. So like the fact that they can apply the passive is very, very good for them. Some apply it better than others, which is something they still have to tackle, like a hero like Hanzo who can't apply the passive very well, but a hero like Tracer who can just makes Tracer very good and Hanzo pretty like C tier. Although I'd argue he's kind of okay as time has gone on. He has a niche. The global healing passive, pretty good when you're out of combat and it's not super noticeable. There are some edge cases where it actually does apply where I'm rounding the corner, taking a new flank angle while taking a lot of damage on a non-support roll and actually getting a couple bits of HP back. It's quite nice, so I would say Patch was great for the game overall. They just need to keep iterating, keep iterating, or continue doing those major season nine PVP refreshes. That's what Aaron Keller called it, the game director. Number one was the initial Overwatch 2 release, 5v5. PVP refresh number two was the season nine patch. PVP refresh number three, they said they want to try to do it annually, but recently have also said maybe semi-annually, so in six months. So February was their first one. Maybe the next one is hitting this August, season 12. I'm down for, you know, big playstyle shifts. I've been playing the same Overwatch game for eight years. I need changes like this to stimulate me or else I get bored. Can an ultimate get value without getting eliminations? Yes. Basically what the title says, I played a game as Ilari, ulted them, didn't get any elims, but it did strike four people and it got close to detonating, but the Lucio ulted and the Kiri Suzu'd it. But does this still bring any value to my team? Yes. Since it brought out a cooldown and an ult from the enemy team, making it less to worry about, I guess? Yes. It's a minor thing, but just had me wondering if ults can still bring value? Yes. Even if it doesn't get any elims? Yes. But lures out other ults and cooldowns? Yes. Also just want to add that I'm still learning the game. I'm in lower ranks and not 100% on everything yet. Okay, so sorry for being facetious and, you know, I'm not trying to be condescending and like, I'm just shitty humor. I know you're a new player, learning player. The, the real answer after poking a bit of fun is yes. Forcing big cooldowns, like you said, of course brings value. What is value in a game like this? Anytime they respond with any ability or cooldown or an ultimate, obviously getting an elimination is like the number one priority. And that's what you were kind of dialed in on, but forcing Suzu, forcing Lucio alt, great resource trading because it also can misposition them, disposition them. I'm not actually sure what the correct term is. Disposition or misposition? I think misposition, displace them, let's use that. The fact that it struck four people means it applied a slow onto all four people. And the fact that it applied a slow is CC and it makes them kind of like wander and it, it makes it a bit slower for them again and into cover. Obviously they got Suzu'd so they were able to walk at full speed and it got rid of it. But all in all, like if they didn't have Suzu, it slows them, it can displace them, which is great and it generates aggro. If you're a tank player in any MMO, you know what aggro is. The fact that you Ilari ulted them, generated aggro, now they have to turn to you, force attention onto you flying in the sky. Sometimes they challenge you back or they stop looking at the person that they were attacking and they realize they got sunstruck by Ilari and now they can't shoot the person because they're panicking and trying to run into cover. Generated aggro. So that's value. What is worse or better? Too aggressive or too timid? Does it depend on role? It's better to be too aggressive than too timid. Does it depend on role? No, depends actually, depends. One of my other pursuits is live theater and when directing actors uh, and when directing actors for the stage, there's an adage that states that an actor who is too over the top is better than one who is timid because the over the top actor can be toned down in rehearsal, but it will be far more difficult to get the timid actor to come out of their shell. This is a great comparison metaphor that can work in Overwatch as well. Yes. It is same applies to Overwatch. Is it better to train yourself by going balls to the wall aggro, making the big risky plays that will often fall flat than learning how to pull black? But put it another way though, if you're going to learn from mistakes, is it better to make those mistakes aggressively or is it preferable to play it safe? So you answered yourself. This this adage is, is perfectly encapsulates what I was gonna say. Always better to over alt and use your ultimate and not save it for Overwatch 5 PVE because you know, being able to use your ultimate and assess whether it was good or bad gives you a data point, uh, an entry into your mind, a core memory, a boundary that you pushed so that next time a similar situation comes up, you can reassess and be like, ooh, last time I ulted in the situation where they had this ultimate, it didn't turn out so well. So maybe it's not that good. But if you were the passive person, too timid, and you were like passive and holding your ultimate till Overwatch 5 PVE, like I said, how do you know? You have no data point, no memory of ever using it in that scenario. So you don't know when to use it, period. At least if you're aggressive, you tried it, you you threw some shit at the wall, maybe it stuck, maybe it didn't 
stick. Do you take more damage on PC, even in low metal ranks? When using Winston on console, you kind of just jump on people and they die. DPS don't know how to shoot. Sensitivity is too low to track you. And I'm beginning to think that the low metal ranks on console are just flat out worse than PC metal ranks. Because when I try and die these same people that look out of position in silver, they actually shoot back and I lose my health seemingly out of nowhere. I assume this is on PC. I get people to half health or lower, but then Kiriko jumps in and Suzu's denying my entire attack. It's less taking more raw damage because obviously the, the damage numbers are, are bound to the character's code design. But the TTK or the time to kill per hero goes faster because um, people are just simply better at aiming. I would argue that yes, metal rank console is worse than PC metal rank simply because mouse and keyboard does give you a bit more aiming freedom. Probably until you hit that point in console and like high masters GM top 500 where then you start getting Zimmers that have a mouse and keyboard with the aim assist given to a controller. There are some people with a controller plus aim assist who can probably out aim a, a mouse and keyboard person. That's no, that's like not even anything controversial to say in the whole console versus PC war, but you definitely have more polling and more dexterity on a mouse and keyboard because it has a lot more data points and polling rates for it to like track your sense versus a controller where you're limited by the anchor of your thumb and the precision is hard to compare in that sense. But yes, the TTK and the response uh, probably a lot faster on, on PC than console. How do you feel about Soldier 76 in the current state of the game? Let me start by saying I love Soldier. I've honed my tracking skills, always do well with him. But I also realize that he has certain limits and is often outclassed by so Sojourn and or Cassidy. They kind of do similar things, but different at the same time. So let me cook with this. How do you feel about Soldier? I don't see him played very often in Low Master's High Diamond. Do you think he needs a buff of some form? Also, I'm yet to grasp if the Sojourn changes, he might be creeping closer to viability again. I would love to hear other thoughts. I think Soldier has his niche, his role, his B tier kind of like average, you know, does a bit of everything, but not too strong in one category, good at peppering and pressuring. And uh, I think the people that take advantage of his sprint ability to take certain angles and high ground and take advantage of the fact that he is self-sustained and hold that ground for as long as possible, that's where his strength is, not necessarily his damage. It's this consistent damage output versus like the burst from Sojourner Cassidy. For example, going up the, you know, top right side of King's Row when you attack, go around the statue, like hard right, up the stairs, then you hold that high ground, put a heel pad down, or even jump over to the next high ground, and boom, you have that controlled. You have some self-sustained with your thing. Very hard for them to pick you off. But if you're a Sojourn and you solo slide up there right away, you have no slide down, and you don't have a defensive tool like the Biotic Field, you can't go anywhere. But Soldier has Biotic Field, and he can sprint away a, a lot quicker without burning that cooldown. Same with Cassie, it just takes him forever to get up there. It's a strong position to be in, but it's just, Cast just takes too long to get up there. Does that make sense? He can pepper pretty well. If you have great tracking, he's not bad. His aim style is a little different when compared to Sojourn or Cassidy. Besides Sojourn's SMG, Sojourn's rail and Cassidy is like a single target burst. Better hit it. And if you're just bad at hitting those, you're probably better off playing slow peppering heroes like Soldier, which rewards track aiming and keeping your cursor on the target versus like hitting that one shot here and there at like a Widow, like a Cast, like an Ash. It just depends on you and your, your aim style. All right, last question. Sombra's ruining the game for me. How the hell am I supposed to fight her? I'm a gold player, so little to no teamwork is involved in my games. That's why I asked this question. Most answers I've seen are dependent on having a team work together, but I just can't ever seem to beat her unless I'm on Moira and then I just fade away with the heal orb. How am I supposed to overcome an advantage as large as invisibility plus no abilities plus attack from behind plus dot? It just seems absurd to me. Okay, we'll pick it apart one at a time. Invisibility just comes with awareness, recognizing which angle Sombra can come from. Now, this kind of ties into the attack from behind. If you anticipate a Sombra coming, you have to limit her angles. If you are wide in the open, you are 360 degrees open from getting hacked, attacked, and a dot that you can't predict where it's coming from. Playing behind a single piece of cover on one side, you literally cut your options that she can come out of in half. And most Sombras, I would assume, do not come from the front, so you can eliminate 180 degrees from the front in most occasions, especially if you're getting surprised by her. So then that leaves your behind. You tuck your back or your side on one side, where else is, is she gonna come from? Probably just your left. You, you minimize the amount of openings she can have. Number two, 
You can interrupt her hack if you anticipate her coming, depending on the hero and how easy it is. Like a little peppery hero, like a Tracer or like a Mora, just quickly look at her, interrupt her flow, and she will probably not hack you, which minimizes some of the damage and the DPS that it will that she will output. Number three, you do have to have like pretty solid uh, movement if you want to hopefully dodge some of her bullets. This is not just a dealing versus Sombra skill. This is an Overwatch skill. Just getting used to the strafing pattern. Very, very important to always add a little bit of movement wherever you can. Now, one thing that people always mention about strafing is ADAD, left, right, left, right, which is fine if you're dealing with targets in the front of you. If you anticipate with those conditions I met earlier, nobody, she's not coming from the front, your back is on the right side, uh, sorry, your back is up against the wall or some piece of cover, similar to your right side, there's some obstruction where it's likely the Sombra will come from your left. A left, right, left, right AD strafe does nothing from the Sombra's POV, you're kind of just like, you're doing this, which means you could just shoot a straight line at you. So in some cases, I actually do strafe WS, WS, or forward backwards, or because I have good sensitivity and like I'm aware of the Sombra, I will quickly snap and look at her. Then the Sombra's on a perpendicular angle, and then the AD strafing means more. But until I turn around, I will actually, if I hear the unstealth, I'll actually WS for half a second till I'm ready to turn around, and then I'll AD. Those are a couple of tips to help you uh, hopefully deal with Sombra a little better than obviously the best options. Let your team know. Teamwork makes the dream work. That's the questions for this week. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week.